Now, one of the things I'm going to warn you about is that this lecture is going to go a little bit faster than the last few, mainly because it's mostly pictures. But hopefully you'll still learn a lot of good stuff. Um, the pages that this lecture is based off of are right here, 100 through 114 in the textbook. And with that said, let's jump in. So first off, what is a cloud? Now, most people jokingly say, ah, oh, meteorologists just look at clouds. And, you know, I, I hope that after these first several modules that you don't believe that anymore. But in case you do, let's look at some clouds. So first off, how does a cloud form? Well, clouds are basically visible groupings of water droplets. Basically what happens is as warm, moist air rises in the atmosphere, it expands, it cools, and condenses. Now remember that. Expansion, cooling, and condensing. That is your mantra for the remainder of this course. As air rises, it expands, it cools, and condenses. Now as it condenses, water droplets grow in size, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger, eventually to a point where they become visible. Once they become visible, they are classified as clouds. Now, cloud droplets are still very, very small. If you've ever flown through a cloud on a plane, um, it really looks hazy outside rather than just doused in rain. Well, the fact of the matter is, is cloud droplets are one million times smaller than a typical raindrop. Now we'll talk about why that is um, in our next module when we talk about precipitation, but for now, just take my word for it. Now clouds form and, and have many different forms, many different types of clouds at many different altitudes, and they bring forth many, many different types of weather. So let's talk about some of the weather that they bring. Let's talk about some of the clouds. Now, I'm sure you've seen many different types of clouds. Some look nice and puffy, like these cumulus clouds down here. Others look very wispy and feathery, like these cirrus up here. And others hang out right near the ground, like these stratus here. And we see a lot of these here in the Bay Area. If you've ever looked to our west over at the Santa Cruz Mountains, Sometimes you'll even see clouds hanging out over there and they look like fog. Well, that's what these kind of clouds are up here. Now, with that said, there are many different types of clouds. And the way that we classify the difference between one and another is using a system called the Howard's Classification System. And it's still used today. It, it, was created in the 1800s and has been improved, but what it did was it split up clouds into four different layers, four different types. You have stratus clouds, which are very sheet-like clouds. They tend to be pretty thin, maybe only a few hundred feet thick, and they cover everything just like a sheet does. Then you have cumulus clouds, which will look like balls of cotton, you have cirrus clouds, which look like feathers, pulled apart cotton, wisps. And then you have nimbus clouds, which are rain clouds. Here's a good example of a stratus cloud. Here, you notice that the cloud is covering the entire area. Here's a cumulus cloud, looking like a nice big ball of cotton, very puffy. Cirrus clouds. These look extremely wispy, like pulled apart cotton. And here's a nimbus cloud. This is a cloud that's raining down on a city. And right here, this is actually the rain shaft. So it almost looks like the cloud is extending down onto the ground, almost like a fog. That's actually rain. Now, this Howard system is good, but it doesn't really give us a lot of what we need to know. And so the Howard system, while it was a good start, it was modified and improved by two gentlemen named uh, Ralph Abercrombie, uh, not related to Abercrombie and Fitch, at least I don't think so, 
And Hugo Hildebrandson, try saying that name 10 times fast. Well, they made some modifications to the Howard system, and they came up with what's called the modified Howard system. Nice enough not to take the name, so that's good of them. And this system takes clouds and splits them up into a few different groups based on the cloud's altitude. Let's take a look at them. So here is the modified Howard system. And it splits clouds up into four different categories. You have low clouds down here. These are clouds near the surface of the Earth. Most of them, like the stratus clouds, are very low clouds that have no real vertical development to them. And then you have these cumulus clouds here which do have vertical development. Now I'll get to this guy over here in a few minutes. The next category are what are called middle clouds. These all have the prefix alto in front of them, whereas these ones down here all have strato in them, except for the cumulus clouds. But again, we'll talk about that in a moment. And then these upper level clouds all have the term cirro in them. Cirro cumulus, cirro stratus, and cirrus. These are high clouds. So we have low strato clouds, mid alto clouds, and high cirro clouds. Now, as I promised, what about this guy right here? Well, there's one type of cloud that actually forms via vertical development, and that's called the cumulus cloud. Now, many times cumulus clouds hang out near the surface and they're just low clouds. However, they do have some vertical motion. Basically, these form as warm air from the ground rises and condenses, forming the cloud. If this air is warm enough, it can continue to rise and continue to rise. And these cumulus clouds can actually break through into the mid-cloud section and maybe even into the high-cloud section. In that case, they become what are called cumulus congestus, and if they end up reaching all the way to the top of the troposphere, which again is called the tropopause, they can actually fan out forming this anvil-like shape and become what's called a cumulonimbus cloud. And so this cloud, the cumulonimbus cloud, can actually span multiple layers. Whereas stratus clouds hang out near the surface, they're low clouds, Alto clouds in the middle, cirro clouds up in the top. Cumulonimbus clouds can actually span all three layers. Now let's take a look at a few of these clouds. So first off, let's talk about low clouds. These all have the prefix strato to them. And there are three types. Stratus, stratocumulus, and nimbostratus. A stratus cloud is again just a uniform sheet of grayish looking clouds. Stratocumulus clouds are low, but they have a little bit of lumpiness to them, almost like lumps and mashed potatoes. And then nimbostratus, these are the ones that actually give us rain. These look wet, and you see rain falling from them. Now, most stratus clouds, because they hang out near the surface of the Earth, they're warm, and as a result, they very rarely have ice crystals in them. They're primarily just water. So here's a stratus cloud, like the one that I showed you a little bit earlier. Here are some stratocumulus clouds. Again, they're lower and they're more layered, but they have a little bit of puffiness in them. And then here are some nimbostratus clouds. These nimbostratus clouds again look very dark and gray and rain is usually falling from them. Moving up into the mid-level, these clouds are called alto clouds and they begin with the prefix alto. They span from approximately 6,500 to 23,000, 60, yeah, 6,500 to 23,000 feet. A um, little bit higher in the tropics, much lower in the polar latitudes. Um, We'll talk about why that is in a few modules. Um, now, mid-level clouds 
are mainly composed of liquid water, but there's a little bit of ice in them. And there are two main types of mid-level clouds. Alto cumulus. These look like little round balls of clouds. They're just, they're very tiny and very bulgy, just round. And then alto stratus, which is just basically a little sheet of clouds. And in fact, they're thin enough oftentimes for you to even see the sun through them. Here's alto cumulus clouds, and you can identify them just as small little puffy bulges. It almost looks like the sky is boiling in a way. And then this is an alto stratus cloud. So here, it looks like just a layer of clouds, but it's very thin. So the sun can still peek through, though it's only translucent. It's not fully transparent. It still looks kind of gray, and it feels like rain is coming. And in fact, these alto stratus clouds are usually the sign of an approaching front. So when you see them, know that rain is on the way. And then finally, there are high-level clouds. Now, high-level clouds occupy the very top of the troposphere. They hang out near the tropopause. And again, they're a little bit lower in the air near the poles, a little bit higher in the air near the tropics. But again, we'll talk about that later. later. Now, these clouds are very thin very thin, very feathery thin, and they're made up entirely of ice crystals because the air in the upper trophosphere is extremely cold with temperatures sometimes as low as 60 degrees below zero. So they get really cold. There are three types, cirrus, cirrocumulus, and cirrostratus. Cirrus clouds are the feathery, wispy-like ones. Cirrocumulus are very tiny, little puffs. They, they almost look like little pimples in a way. Um, they are oftentimes looking like fish scales, which hence the term mackerel sky. And then cirrostratus is a very thin, transparent layer of clouds. These are actually what give you a halo around either the sun or the moon. And I'll show you that in a second. So here are some cirrus clouds. Just Again, thin, wispy, little streaks of clouds, entirely made up of ice. Cirrocumulus clouds, they look like the scales of a, skin, of a fish skin, or they look like the scales of a fish, hence the term mackerel sky. And they're tiny, round, puffy, but again, they're very thin. And then cirrostratus clouds. And when cirrostratus clouds are overhead, you can still see through them almost. They're almost perfectly transparent, but there's just enough in the sky to where you can actually see a halo around the sun or the moon. Now make sure if you see some cirrostratus clouds out and you're looking up, make sure to put your fist where the sun is so that you're blocking it out so you don't blind yourself. I don't want any of you going to anybody and saying, yeah, my teacher told me to look at the sun. So don't do that. Put your fist in front of it. Um, this actually can be a telltale sign of rain approaching. And we'll talk about that in a few weeks when we talk about weather forecasting. Now, the other types of clouds on the uh, modified Howard system are vertical clouds. These are also called cumuliform clouds. These occur because you have unstable air, which we'll talk about next time. Unstable air is air that's able to rise really high into the atmosphere. And as a result, it can form very tall, towering-like clouds that can span thousands and tens of thousands of feet. And there are two main types of cumuliform clouds. There's cumulus and cumulonimbus. Cumulus clouds are puffy white clouds that look like cotton balls. And these take the forms of cumulus humulus, which are just small fair weather clouds, cumulus fractus, and cumulus congestus. Now, cumulus congestus is kind of the predecessor to cumulonimbus clouds. At this point, 
there's a substantial amount of rising air and there's a substantial amount of moisture and hence rain is beginning to form and this actually allows thunderstorms to even develop. Eventually, as these, cumul as these cumulus congestus clouds continue to rise, they reach the tropopause. At the tropopause, the air can't rise any further. Therefore, it fans out, creating what looks like an anvil shape. That is where cumulonimbus clouds form. So here are some of those cumulus humulus clouds. Here are some cumulus fractus clouds. Again, they've got that puffiness to them, but they look a little broken. Cumulus congestus clouds. So here's a case where you have a cumulus cloud that is building pretty tall vertically. And then cumulonimbus clouds. And at this point, the cloud has risen so high in the atmosphere, it's fanned outwards, creating this brilliant top. Now, the last type of cloud I'm going to talk about, and I'll talk about this for the next five to ten minutes, is fog. Now, we are very, very used to fog here in the Bay Area because it happens all the time. Here's an image that I took from an Amtrak train um, just as I was returning to the Bay Area from an internship. And this right here is the Golden Gate Bridge. These two little pillars sticking out right here. That's the Golden Gate Bridge. And it's covered in fog. So fog's pretty common here in the Bay Area. Well, how does fog form? Well, there's actually three types of fog. And the three types of fog are called radiation fog, advection fog, and upslip fog. So let's talk about them. So radiation fog occurs right near the ground and is often referred to as ground fog. Now the way radiation fog forms is it forms when the air near the ground becomes very cold, which it does every night. Remember, at night, the ground is the first thing to lose its heat. Therefore, the air near the ground can become extremely cold. If the air near the ground becomes extremely cold, that causes the air to quickly become saturated. Remember, the colder the air is, the more saturated it is. That was from last time when we talked about relative humidity. The lower the temperature, the higher the relative humidity. Well, what happens is as the ground cools, you get a lot of condensation in the moisture, and this keeps this fog hanging out near the surface. Now, this also causes an inversion to form. Now, an inversion occurs when temperature increases with height. Since the air near the ground is very cold and the air above it is much warmer, that's what an inversion is. The air higher is warm, then the air below is cold. So in this case, the air near the ground kind of just hangs out there. And it can't go anywhere. And in this case, fog can actually stick around for a very long period of time, for days even. And it's very common in valleys. And in fact, the California Central Valley, which is seen in this picture right here, is prone to radiation fog during the fall and winter time as the air here gets really cold. And not only that, but the cold air from the Sierras and the coastal ranges actually drains into the valley, making it even colder. The next type of fog formation, and this is the type that's the most common here in the Bay Area, is called advection fog. The way advection fog works is the same way that you might actually see fog forming on the edges of a glass of water. What actually happens is the air away from that water is very warm, has a lot of moisture in it. As it moves over that cold surface of the glass, it cools down and condenses rapidly. Well, the same thing happens in the atmosphere. If you have warm air moving over cool waters, that causes the moisture in the air to quickly condense, 
creating advection fog. This is very common wherever there's a cold ocean current, such as the Eastern Pacific, where we live. We live on the Eastern Pacific, right next to the eastern end of the Pacific Ocean, the west coast of the United States, and very, very commonly over the Eastern Pacific. Even more common here along the California coastline. Now what happens though is as the fog moves inland, the inland area is substantially warmer than that cold water. So that causes the fog to evaporate inland. So here's how this works. Here's how we get our fog here in California. There are a few different steps. The first step is the presence of what's called the Pacific High Pressure. Now we'll talk more about this in a few weeks, but off our coastline, there's this high pressure system that occupies the Pacific Ocean. We're on the eastern end of it. So over here is the eastern end. And here, air is traveling south. It's traveling from the north to the south. As it travels, as it travels from north to south, it actually forces warm water near the surface offshore and cold water from below to rise up and take its place. This is what's called coastal upwelling. What that does is that makes the waters off the coast warm and the waters on the coast cold. So we get this situation where we have warm water offshore, cold water right near the coastline. Now this warm water offshore creates warm air. At the same time, winds are actually blowing from the ocean onshore. As this happens, this warm air travels over the colder coastal waters. As a result, it quickly cools and condenses, and we get fog. So it's upwelling that cools our water, right here near the coastline, and then the warm air from offshore moves towards this cold water, where it cools and condenses. Now, What's actually interesting is here in California, we are the most prone to this upwelling because of the geometry of our coastline. As a result, the waters here off the California coastline are much colder than even the waters off of Puget Sound and much of the Oregon and Washington coastlines. So the water here is actually pretty cold. Even in Central and Southern California, it's colder, or at least as cold, as the water up near Oregon and Washington. Fascinating fact. This, however, leads to lots of advection fog. Again, that, that warm air offshore moves onshore, cooling and condensing and forming fog. Now what this means for us Giants fans here in the San Francisco Bay Area is during the summertime when this upwelling is the most common and that high pressure system is the strongest, it actually leads to cooler temperatures than in the fall months. And this actually creates an interesting scenario for San Francisco where San Francisco is actually colder in June, July, and August than it is in September and October. Don't believe me if you're taking this during a summer class, take Caltrain up to San Francisco, and even if it's hot here in San Jose, you go up to San Francisco, they're wearing coats and boots and it's a lot colder. This even inspired a famous quote often attributed to Mark Twain. The coldest winter I ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. Now the last type of fog I'm going to talk about is called upslope fog. In the case of upslope fog, you simply have air near the surface that is pushed up and over a mountain. As the air rises up the mountain, it expands, cools, and condenses, forming fog. So it just looks something like this. You have warm, moist air near the surface, 
as it hits the mountainside, it rises up and condenses into fog. This is very common on the windward side of mountains. That's the side of mountains where the air is blowing towards the mountain. So this area right here is called the windward side. The other side of the mountain is called the leeward side. But here on the windward side, as moist air hits the mountain, it rises up the mountain and forms fog. And that's it for this module. Um, next module, we're actually going to be talking a lot about rising air and how it produces precipitation. Until then, congratulations on finishing up module three. Please don't hesitate to email me if you have any questions. Until next time, I'm Terrence Mullins. Thank you all for listening.